Welcome back to the Green Swamp, well, East Green Swamp, part two. Everyone with me, I have Mark. Mark is the keeper here. <laughs> what is your role here? I'm a check station operator. We just um, check people in and out for permission to hunt and then check out animals, certain types of animals, deer and hogs mainly. We have to check out way and log in on paperwork for uh, FWC to keep track of. Now what about a small game? Do you gotta track that? Information and stuff. What? What about a small game? Do you gotta track any small game? No, just hogs. Hogs and we deer? Keep, yeah, we keep track of them just for the fun of it. People want to know, but like squirrels and stuff, we don't track them. They tell us and we write it on the board for so everybody can know, but uh, wild hogs and deer are the only ones that we have to, to uh, check in and log. And turkeys during turkey season. Okay. But not rabbits, squirrels, stuff like that. Last time we talked, we got a little late for the interview. Uh, you said you had some uh, some good hunting stories that you wanted to share. Hunting stories? Oh, let's see. About the one I got lost, had to get rescued out of the woods. I went hunting in an area out here. Well, actually, I was fishing up the river, and it started raining. And I thought, I'm right by that road that I like to walk in the rain because I always see something when I'm walking that road in the rain. So I said, I'll just go down there and I just jumped down in my truck and I just grabbed my shotgun. I didn't carry my pack. Had my phone in my pocket, was almost dead. Didn't carry any lights or anything, but I had shells in my pocket for my shotgun. And I got down the road about 200 yards and some hogs ran across the road in front of me. So I went right after them and just started following them through the woods, not on any trail, but I could see where they'd been. And I was tracking them for about an hour and the sun started going down. I thought I better get out of here and find a fire break to get out of here and get back to my truck. And uh, I found, I was walking through the swamp and I seen a little trail. So I started walking and I said, maybe this will take me out. And I walked it, and I walked it, and I walked it, and then the trail kind of fizzled out, so I tried to stay on it. But when I did, um, about an hour later, I seen footprints in the mud. And I looked at them, I'm like, all right, I must be getting close to a, a trail where I can get out of here. And um, ends up I had walked in a big circle in, in the woods for about an hour, and those were my boot prints. <laughs> and now the sun was going down. Excuse me just a minute. Got you, buddy. He's doing an interview. Like I said, it looks like he's interviewing you. I'm a celebrity on YouTube now. What time is it? What time is it? What is that? 8 p.m. What is this stuff? See you, buddy. Okay, so anyway, uh, the sun started going down, and uh, I had passed a ladder tree stand that was attached to a tree, and I kind of kept track of where it was in case of emergency, I could go back there and climb up in it. And turns out that needed to be the case. And uh, it got dark and I tried to wave my phone around and get a signal and I only had like 2% battery left, so I couldn't use it for a light. And um, I had like one bar and it wouldn't get through and it wouldn't get through and I climbed up in the stand and I stood up and I was waving it in the air and I got a bar and I hit 911. And by that time, the check station operators knew me and knew that I wasn't out on time. Somehow, they sent a text to ask me if I was lost, and I said yes. And so they sent the, they made the call, and FWC started to come out and uh, do a rescue, which is a normal rescue operation. I think they would tell you they would send out an airplane, maybe two airplanes with infrared, a helicopter, a dog unit on the ground, and then about uh, seven uh, officers on the ground. And they make a command station out in the woods and uh, try to locate you. But that day it rained all day. It rained nine inches that day. It was one of the worst rains we'd had in forever. And the rain from morning to night and was raining all night when the dark. So I climbed up in the stand and thought, I'll just stay here and put my belt around the, the stand and lay down and sleep it off till daylight comes and then I'll find my way back out. I wasn't totally lost. I knew I was in Green Swamp and I knew kind of where I needed to be. I just got turned around in directions because you sometimes can't see the sun and stuff when you're in the swamps. And uh, 
it turned pitch black. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I couldn't see a tree line in the sky. It was just total blackness. And um, I'd sit there for about an hour and a half, and I'm just soaking wet. I had five layers of clothes on, including this jacket I'm wearing. And um, I was soaked. My lighters were soaked. I couldn't start a fire. I heard the hogs run under my stand as soon as it got dark. They showed up to let me know that, uh, ha, ha, ha. I couldn't see them, but I heard them right under my stand. And so I'm sitting there in the dark, pouring down rain, and it's getting cold. It got down to 40 degrees, and I started shivering pretty bad. And I've hunted in the snow and things before when I was young, and I didn't know I could make it through the cold, but I guess I'm not as young as I used to be. And I started shivering and shaking so bad that it, it worried me that I might not do well overnight. And um, <clears throat> so I got that phone call and I called 911 and they answered the phone and I told them, I said, I don't talk, just listen to me because my phone's probably going to turn off. And I said, told them my name, told them the area I was in and then I was in Green Swamp and the only way that you will find me is probably to fire a gun and I will fire back for a shot for you to find me. And it was the sheriff's office dispatch that was, was on the phone. And they immediately went into panic mode that I'm a man with a gun in the woods calling for cops to come find it. So it became a thing for them. And um, well, a little while later, I seen a, in total blackness, I, could, I seen a, a, a band of light go across the tops. And I could see it going across the tops of the trees at that time, like a flashlight or spotlight or something. So I knew they were out there looking for me. So I fired my shotgun into the ground and they fired back. And so waited a little while and they fired back and they were in a different area and I fired back. That went on for about an hour and a half and about six shotgun shells. I had 10 with me so I was lucky. They were worried I'd run out of shots and they couldn't find me. The rain was so bad, the storm was so bad that they couldn't send out the helicopter and the uh, airplane, which they had in infrared, they'll find you pretty quick with, with infrared from the plane. But uh, like I said, that wasn't, they weren't able to do that. So the gunshots went on and some Polk County sheriffs, three of them, showed up at my stand and they began to climb my stand and demand that I hand them my gun. And I'm like, I'll give you my gun, but let me unload it. And they're like, no, 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 no. I guess they thought I was gonna shoot by unload. I said, no, let me break it down. And the guy reached up, the sheriff reached up and grabbed my gun and tried to pull it out of my hand. And they were pulling. I said, let me unload the thing because you're going to pull it down and point it at me when you're going down the ladder. <laughs> and so I finally got the lever and I popped it open and the shells fell out. And then they got me down on the ground. And the first thing they said was, we see you're the smartest one out here. And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm the one lost. They said, you're the only one with boots on. And there was like, there was nowhere that there wasn't two or three inches of water standing. It wouldn't soak in faster than it was falling. So they, they led me through the woods and got me out to a sheriff's truck. And when I got out, there was nine FWC trucks out there with the dogs and everything. And I was happy to see everybody and get out of there because it was cold. I wasn't scared. I had a lot of training for incidents like that, going through Boy Scouts and things with when I was young. and. Uh, you know, the worst thing you can do is panic in a situation like that. You need to stop, stay still, don't walk around in these woods. These cypress knees could trip you and you could fall and get hurt really bad with a cypress knee or something like that. So, if it ever happens to you, do what I did. Find somewhere and sit and wait till daylight or till help comes. So the, that was an interesting thing. So, and it's funny because the area I got lost in, I had been hunting in for six years. So all my hunting buddies had to make fun of me and stuff, you know, and that was a that was a kind of a story for a couple of years. They nicknamed me GPS after that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's lots of stories people could tell you out here, different things. Um, one of the interesting stories that catches a lot of people's attention was back in, I think it was 2003, and it's listed in Russell McCoy's book, The Green Swamp Journal, which you can find on Amazon. He's got the story on it uh, with probably 
better details because I'm just telling you off the top of my head. But uh, a guy named Charlie Huff left his house one morning and left his wife there and he got dinner out to thaw out so he could cook dinner when he got home that evening and told his wife he's going hunting out here at Green Swamp. And I guess he was a regular, a lot of the guys had known him and all, and he went to his regular spot where he always sat. And um, I guess later on I wasn't out here. I was just starting to hunt this area back then. And um, I heard about it, but I wasn't out here. Uh, I guess his wife came and said he never came home, you know, and he had kind of like maybe left a note for the getting dinner ready and had stuff out of the freezer thawing. And, so it wasn't like he didn't plan on not returning home and they began to search for him. They found his car parked out there in a spot and they searched and they never did find him uh, for hours. So then all the hunters and the whole place started hunting. Okay, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Y'all done? Yeah. All right. See you later. Congratulations, buddy. Okay. Um, just had some gentlemen shot five hogs here just finishing up check station today and uh, congratulations to them but um so they searched and then all the hunters started getting together and all the hunters in the woods went like 10 feet apart and just walked the line everywhere they could the search ended up going for I guess around two months and they never found him never found his body never found him any signs or anything except his car parked on the road. So there's been a lot of iffy stories to say what happened. It was a trick and he left his wife and parked the car out here and ran off. Uh, he was murdered by somebody and they parked the car out here. Uh, you know, nobody knows. But that was in 2003. This is 2021 and he has still never been found. So that's a historic story for here. Hopefully the only one that never happens again. But, uh, there are those chances. This is 50,000 and some odd acres, and there's a lot of swamp. Yeah, this place is huge. Thick areas that uh, it's easy to get hurt or get lost or turned around or have health issues, and no one knows you're there. And wildlife could have done something, you know, and drug him off. I hate to say all those kind of things. That bad to think of but that's the real reality of hunting these types of places that there are wildlife out here that are not tame and um gosh there's so many hunting stories there's funny ones and, um, well i had a couple i had a couple uh questions on uh our last video people would like to know if we can metal detect out here the what now metal detect uh, metal detecting would be a great opportunity out here for all the historic things that are out here. But uh, according to the FWC brochure and through Swift Mud, metal detecting is not allowed in Green Swamp East or Green Swamp West for that matter. And I, uh, for a little understanding on maybe why is because some of the historic things that are in here, they want to remain here and people will pick things up and take them home. They've stole the siding off of one of our old historic buildings down, we call it the Hunter's Hotel, on the river. For about eight beds were in there and it was all sided with the old cypress from the cypress trees out here. Well, that became an illegal wood to gather. And so now old cypress is worth money. And I was fishing down there every day for several weeks. And one day I went down there and half the siding was gone. And then within two weeks, all the siding was gone off of it. Someone or some people apparently took all the cypress siding off there. The, the shack is still there, but the siding's all gone off of it. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, they wouldn't want you going down there and metal detecting and possibly finding some historic things that uh, you're not even re supposed to remove a plant or anything out of here or bring anything new in as far as plants and things like that. Um, biologists and stuff, they have weeds in here and different types of growth that are not native and sometimes the hogs will root it and spread it around and so that's an issue. It's one of the things they call pink root. It looks like a green grass on top but the roots in the ground are pink and red and the hogs love to eat those. But yeah, as, uh, according to all the rules of metal detecting is not legal.
I would love to do it. I'd like to find those balls or coins or. Yeah, it would be nice to go there, to the There's Stewart's. 100, maybe 200 years of history out here of different things that's happened through the years. And yeah, it would be nice to go to the Stewart's uh, place and go looking for more money than yeah, the, uh, yeah, the buried. Uh, so the Stewart's Ranch would be a nice place to go back to. I can tell you that much. Yeah, there's a, there's a registered historic homestead site here. There's no sign up, I think, that says it's registered. Uh, but it's not far off from one of the main roads. Uh, a lot of people know where it's at. There was a homestead there years ago and some people called the Stewarts lived there. And part of their family still lives here in Zephyr Hills. And a matter of fact, one of them is uh, a landlord of mine now and he's the fifth great nephew. Four of you, three. Three? Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, I met him, uh, I met him last weekend. And uh, he's a great guy. I met him out there hunting. And um, we've become friends over the years, and now he's got a little place behind his house. That when I, I moved down here from up north to work here all the hunting season, so my house isn't here, so I stay with him. It's not far by, but he's even petitioned, or not petitioned, but um, asked the state, inquired, and he's allowed to be buried in that where the homestead is. There's now a cemetery there where um, the grandparents that lived there had a nephew lived with them and uh, we already told this story once. Or? Yeah, we told us last week. This, that was our part one. Yeah, and they were, they were murdered and by their nephew. If you guys, if you guys are, are just not watching this part two, go back to my part one. It's the uh, Green, East Green Swamp documentary slash uh, Axe Murderer House. So this one's gonna be part two historic events or historic hunting stories and stuff like that for part two yeah if you ever come here uh you might ask the check station operator that works there uh in either one of the check stations there's one on each side of the property on rock ridge gate rock ridge road gate and then the 471 so he can be buried out there he can he has to pay for a, a permit to be buried there but because he's it's a historic place because he's a direct descendant, he is a direct descendant. Well, that would not be bad of, to be buried out here. The guy that's buried out there, and so he can be if he desires. I don't know if he will or not because he's got a wife and children that may want to visit, and that might make it hard on them. I don't know, but that's his decision. Whatever he comes up with when the time comes, but he's still a youngster. He's only fifty. Oh, so he's, <laughs> since he's married, he just take them all with him. Yeah. 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 But you know, there's that. There's a lot of different history. There's some things out here that I don't even know. There's there's some shacks out there, I guess, where people have lived off the power lines and different things, or places where they stopped over and stayed when they were traveling. And back then, I assume by horseback. And uh, there were times when vehicles were used in here for transportation. There's one old broken one truck down there, all rusted in the ground that somebody abandoned. And, Another one down here. Um, this place right here where we're sitting used to be a logging town. There were houses. Did I cover that yet? Yep. Okay. And um, all back through here used to be the uh, cypress logging where they, there you'll find cypress stumps back there. There's two that I know of that you could probably fit a dozen men inside one of these stumps. And, um, so it's not just for hunters; it's for hikers and for just to like to. I would say one stuff. thing: hunting here is hard. It's, it's not easy, but you fall in love with the nature and the beauty of this place. I've been hunting here for 25 years, and there's times when I've gone five and ten years without shooting anything. But we're buddies, and a lot of us we all get to share the meat. So I don't go home empty-handed a lot of times. I haven't been here long enough for people to share meat with me yet. Hopefully, I've been, hopefully yeah, you soon. you got to find somebody who's got enough and is willing to share a little bit. Like those guys. They've given me meat. All right, buddy. Take care. Have a good one. Those guys right there in that truck. I want to zoom in. Yeah. Are the ones I caught the five time. hog right there in this truck. They're going down there to the pit to uh, drop off their trap. Yeah, they brought out five hogs and nine squirrels today. The only people who brought anything out for a while.
Yeah, I don't right, bring nothing on today. Kyle here, he's got a few squirrels. And yeah, nothing yeah. today. He brought the yeah, kid. Good squirrels too. You ought to try his recipe sometime. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, some of these roads are are extensions of roads that have been here for a long, long time that were at one point main thoroughfares for traveling back in the day. Um, you know, some people come out here and think of these roads have, they're service roads now for Swift Mud that uh, actually takes care of this property, it's protected and all that, and, um, and, and for the hunters, but some of these roads have old, old names that go back 75 years ago, you know, and they're still named the same today, but they're just old hunting roads now. Uh, yeah, our lives have changed so much. You come out here and learn some of this stuff, and spend some time out here, and you realize how far life has advanced. Uh, when you're a when you're a, a modern citizen of all the things we have today, the stores and the groceries and everything are convenience. And when they lived out here, they had to live off of what they did, pretty much. I mean, of course, they still had. Back in those days, they had stores and things, but they were so far away from where they live. You pretty much, you know, um, shot your own meat. I bet you, I bet you, about seventy-five to hundred years ago, there was a heck of a lot more deer out here. Well, you know, a lot of years ago, there wasn't as many deer as there used to be wow. <laughs> compared to now, because I'm, <clears throat> I'm not sure of what period, and I don't know. Excuse me, all the stories, but there was a point. It may have been in the somewhere between the 70s and the 90s. That's a large span, I know, but I just don't know the year. But uh, the state or whoever it was, somebody that had to be affiliated with the state, they introduced. I think it was Wisconsin deer into Florida, and they released several deer. I know in here years ago, and. Um, Back when I started hunting here, I can remember, well, as recent as probably 2008 was before I moved back north out of state to go to work. Um, in 2008, I can remember at the end of general gun season, we had just under 300 hogs killed on the board. That's just at this gate, not counting the other gate, and 145, 147 deer killed at this gate. It's now 2021 and this year we had 15 hogs killed and 47 deer. So the number has greatly reduced for different reasons and I think we mentioned that in maybe the other video. They've introduced some dog hunting in here to remove the nuisance pigs and uh, they've done some trapping and we also have to deal with poachers. And um, one of the things I'll say right now, he may want to edit this one out, but uh, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a dog hunter and you're out here poaching and you've out here and threatened the lives of some of these people, which has happened here in the last three weeks, we're watching for you, whoever you were. No offense against dog hunters, but these dog hunters were chasing pigs illegally in a non-dog hunting well, area. Well, 12 against two? And and well this just happened yesterday these were pigs the other 12 against two was a deer oh and, my god and i was 12 12 dog hunters that crossed the fence illegally and um when a guy was dragging a deer out that he shot they came and told him they were taking it and uh at gunpoint pretty much took the deer from him and threatened his life and then it happened again yesterday with those guys in the red truck they shot three pigs the deer hunters came up said they were taking them and one said they was going to slice his throat and so jeremy the guy here who stands up for himself most of the time. I probably shouldn't mention names here, but uh, he told them, no, I won't. He said, you're hunting illegally. You're not supposed to hunt dogs in here. You're trespassing and you're poaching, and I'm going to put a bullet in you if you try to take my hog, because I shot this hog, and my sister shot that one, and my buddy shot that one, and we're going to load them up, and we're going to take your license number and your, t and your video picture of your vehicle and take the hogs. And they had a few words, but... Uh, these guys walked away with their hogs and nobody got hurt, thank God, and they were reported to FWC with a license plate number and picture of the vehicle. So, 
spread that news around we're looking for you dog hunters if you're hunting legally that's fine but when you're doing this illegal mm -hmm. stuff and threatening human lives over hogs and deer that's not cool is um if the fwc doesn't find you us still hunters are coming for you we're gonna watch for you and we're gonna make sure that you're gonna stop doing this somehow or another i'm not threatening your life i'm just saying we're gonna have to put a stop to this somehow you're breaking down the fences and driving through illegally we, we got to put cables up and uh, whatever we've got to do it's got to stop guys anyway back to green swamp enough of that <laughs> well hold on a second okay hey we're back i'm mark from green swamp east in uh wonderful central florida in the uh heart of the swamp and agriculture lands of florida this isn't your palm trees and beets. This is swamps and alligators, deer, and, uh, woods, and all that stuff. All right, now let's see that. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story, and I wasn't around, but it's a popular story, pretty well known, and it also is in uh, Russell's book if you want to read up on what he. And it's in Lake Ledger, you said. Yeah, I'll get to that. In story, okay. Okay. Um, Okay, the story goes like this. There was a, a boat from China, a ship, like a, you know, a cargo ship bringing containers over from China to America. And there was a, uh, one of the guys from, I think he was Chinese or, uh, he was Oriental, but, uh, I think he was Chinese. Well, anyway, when they got here, he was one of the ship workers, I guess. He wanted to stay in America. So, um, he just jumped the boat. Well, not knowing anything, um, I guess not a real well-educated man about, uh, you know, like moving to America and what to do or where to go or anything. He just uh, started trying to live in here and there, and he was over, I think, was it St. Peter somewhere? Well, anyway, they found him, and they listed him as crazy, and they put him in a mental ward for two weeks. And... Um, We think, as the story goes, that, that he probably wasn't crazy, but he knew no English and couldn't communicate um, with anybody. And so he was kind of living like a poor man would and taking clothes out of people's backyards and camping in the woods. And well, he ends up over here, he gets out of the, I think escaped was the right term from the middle word, and ends up out here in Green Swamp over on the Rock Ridge side and I guess builds him a shelter out of trees and he was living off of armadillos and things out here in the woods for I guess nearly six months and one of the ways they found out about him is because the people that lived on Rock Ridge Road would have things like laundry come up missing or they'd see him sneaking and stealing a shirt or something you know or food or whatever <clears throat> and um, so the they began to look for the guy, and then the police got involved, and uh, they came out and they found the man. And they arrested him, brought him out, and um, there's two different emotional sides to this story, so I won't tell them both. I'll let you maybe get the book from Russell and read both sides, because he actually has... Um, How many guys that came out of here today? How many pigs came out of here today? I kept hurting hearing it, but... It was all the same guy got them, too. Are you serious? Two of them were just little piglets. You know, oh. so <laughs> they were collateral damage kind of thing, you know. Oh. Yeah, I guess I kept hearing it. Yeah. And I can't get them. They're slim this year. All right, have a good one, buddy. So, um, anyway, I talked to some men that were here, and I witnessed the process of them bringing him out of the woods and putting him in a police car and um, they put him in a police car and he you know couldn't communicate well with English and everything and I guess they found him hung by the neck in a jail cell mm. and uh, but he the story was written up and done in the Lakeland Ledger um, you could probably go to the Lakeland Ledger online and maybe get the archives and look up this story. 
all the things are available that was printed through there and um, pretty interesting story it's a fact he was not a real wild man so to say he I've heard it I've, in the woods I've heard this story before on YouTube uh, I don't know it was in here in East Green Swamp it was in here but it was over on the Rockridge side yeah and people thought it was a, like a, a, a teenage Bigfoot there were all kinds of stories yeah. about it. It turns out he was just a, a regular human being, being, and I think he was just uh, probably not very well off and lived a poor life. If you've ever been to any third world or other countries besides America, yeah, I, I have been to several different countries. I have been to Vietnam. And, um, I've been to Ecuador, Guatemala, and things. And, uh, the regular level of life there is totally different than the regular level of life here. Mm -hmm. We are very blessed to have what we have. Many of the things we take for, for granted are luxury items to those kind of folks. And anyway, I think uh, he just wanted help and he wanted to move his family here from there. So he wanted to establish himself. I get this is the story. But he didn't know how to communicate. He didn't know to go to immigration and get a card or get help from the government or the state or the city or whatever, you know. And that's what he chose to do and it, and it, it led, led to, the, to the final days of his life. And, uh, kind of a sad story to me. I kind of felt like the guy was um, maybe ill-treated because of his lack of communication skills and the way he was living. You know, people, um, you know, especially when you're an officer, you got to think the worst. When yeah. you go to investigate a situation because you don't know what's happening. And so um, there's different stories that he didn't hang himself in the jail. It was done by the police because they didn't want the story done by somebody. You know, different things. You hear all that. But yeah. No one really knows. I said I wasn't going to talk about that because you need to really make up your own mind uh, what you want to believe because... Well, at least he went as down. far as the end of the story goes, we don't know the whole truth. Well, we do know the story about him living in the woods. Well, at least he went down as a legend, though, because people are not mistaken that That's guy as Bigfoot. That's a legendary thing. You know, like yeah. I said, I'll just tell you this. In, in closing up here on this interview with uh, Kyle, I just met him a few weeks ago. And we've talked a lot and kind of come good buddies. He can cook good squirrels, too, so try it. <laughs> First time I ever made it in my lifetime, too. He just needs to take the beef out of it so it's all squirrel stuff. I, I need to get more than just <laughs> one. He was a little scared to try that squirrel the first time, so that's okay. I did it, too. <laughs> now I don't use the beef. You gotta, but uh, squirrel's not a gamey meat normally. It's just a different... Well, I did that because I had two squirrel. One squirrel was like rubber. The other one came off easy, and I was yeah. like, well, damn, I don't have enough meat for this stew. So right. I went and got beef tips. Yeah, that's okay. It was all, it's all good. Still and a whole thing of game. butter garlic. Yeah. It, was oh, it was good. I ate two bowls of it. But um, come on out to Green Swamp if you're interested in hiking, hunting, camping, fishing. We're open 365 days a year to the public, but only open for vehicle access during hunting seasons and hunting days. So if it's a non-hunting day, you probably can't access this place with your vehicle. But beside the gate is a walk-through gate. Well, it's a long walk to the gate. It's like three miles. You can in. You can bicycle in. You can fish 365 days a year. Um, you just can't drive in on, on the roads, you know. And, um, but if you have an electric bike, bring it. You can ride an electric bike. There are all laws concerning electric bikes for in here. One of them is they want to be full-time pedal assist, not throttle, all the time um, for various reasons. That's what the officers have come up with, but I haven't gotten a written rule on it, but they say they want you pedaling your electric bike with pedal assist, not riding it like a moped or motorcycle. Yeah. To, you know. And um, But uh, come on out, ride your bike, walk, hike. I introduced a guy I've known for years and he never knew why I wanted to come out here and he finally came out here to hike and now he's just like Kyle. He can't get enough of the place. We, you know, I'm in love with the place. It's not the greatest hunting place if you're trying to provide meat for yourself, which is why I hunt. Well, this is why the public for sport. I hunt for groceries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I eat wild game pretty much year round if I can. It's and I, I'm new to hunting. This is my first stores. year actually hunting, and I want to be able to start like. 
I believe this country is going down the, the ship basket mm -hmm. real quick, and we're going to have to live off pretty of... pretty much agree in one way or another that that's happening. Yep. Yeah, and we're going to have to live, learn how to live off the land again. Yep. So I'm going to get well, a head know, start on I, it now. There, there might be a time right here in America, you know, there could be a war, a civil war, could be a war with China or Afghanistan or whoever, you know, take your pick. I'm not saying who's going to be in the war, but should that ever happen, and we have to run for cover, you're also going to have to be able to eat and drink when you run for cover, and if it's in the woods, and you're not familiar, you could very well end your last days out in the woods, but if you know a little bit, be an outdoorsman, be a woodsman, know how to survive. You don't have to be a hunter if, if you know, hunting and eating meat and that kind of thing is not for you. There are many plants and trees that you can learn to eat out in the woods to survive. You don't have to live like that. You can go back to your... Yeah, and if you guys don't know what plants to eat... ...in educated places and live like that, but have the knowledge to be able to for a necessity. Yeah, and you'll find, if you cook much, you'll find pretty soon you'll start picking stuff to bring home and cook instead of buying at the store and the, you'll start doing away with some of these chemicals and things and that they put in our, uh, our meals. All right, buddy, have a good one. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know what plants to eat and what not to eat, go to your your local library yes. and go to Edible Plants in Florida. Uh -huh. they, they, I, that's how I learned what I can and can't eat. All right, buddy, how you doing? And if you guys want to learn how to make jam, uh, Beautyberry is so good. It's uh, it kind of just, yeah, it's best for wintertime. The, the dark purple. That's a beauty berry. Sure I know what a beauty berry is. Oh yeah, look it up. It's it's good. You're seeing uh, you don't have none out here right now because they're all dried up, but they're purple, purplish pink berries, and they are delicious. Just don't eat too much of them because you can get sick. But, but too much I, of them. I know we have a lot of people call them blackberries in here, and they may very well be blackberries. Blackberries usually um, normally get pretty large. Yeah. And these don't get real large. And if they're on a red berry that looks like that called a dewberry. And they yeah. look and taste like them. They just don't get quite as big. And if there's a blackberry. There are hundreds of them out here in these briars and stuff during the summer. If you got a blackberry on a red vine, don't eat that. It's no. a poison berry. Oh, is it? It looks like a blackberry. But if it's on a red vine, don't touch it. Oh, I ate one one day. My, my mouth went tingly. I couldn't talk. I think that's why I still can't pronounce yeah, it to this day. experiment with foods out here if you don't know what they are because there are things. I have something to eat over there. This is All right, guys. Uh, so down in the comment section down below, let me know what you guys want for part three. Uh, don't be afraid. I mean, he's. I'm doing a short, a short documentary of this. So it's, this is probably going to be like part three to part five, you know, there's just so much to tell about this place. Um, and he and Mark has no problem, no problem telling you at all. Nope. I, got, I get to sit here and listen to it, so it's great because I get to listen to this while I edit and get to listen to this all over again. So I have no problem. But right now I have to cut this one short. I have to get to St. Pete. I, I'm on a schedule today. So uh, thank you again. Remember down in the comment section, let us know what you want from part three. And come check out Grant Swamp. You can check out West Green Swamp. There's the ones East Green Swamp. I don't know how to get to West. I know how to get here. Uh, again, thank you for, uh, for watching. And there's Mark. In, 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 um, Look at that speech. I just now. wanted to tell you, uh, if you'll notice, you know, it's, Kyle's always got this close-up of his face when he talks to you. I just want to let you know that it's... This is an awful thing to do because he's not wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, hey, I'm home, man. This feels good. I'm just kidding. You really okay. <laughs> and who's been hunting with me today? Right there. What's up? Finally there made the video. Come out and make it a family What's deal. What's popping with Jaden? Kids the outdoors and how to hunt and I'll fish. I'll start making. How to not get lost in the woods. It's all good. My my kids started when they were nine and twelve. My daughter was a better hog hunter than me. But she's married and has a little baby now and works for a big company and has a nice new home and she just doesn't come out here much anymore. But uh, she knows. 
just if you're watching this, first shotgun daddy bought her. If you're watching this, get your ass out of here and come visit your daddy. Hi, <laughs> Ashley and Dustin. <laughs> All right, guys. What's poppin' with Higgins and Mark and Outdoors? Uh, hey, oh yeah, good job. check out Outdoors with Jim too. I'm sorry he's like, like late in the video. That's my dad. He wants to come out here and do a paranormal investigation in the daytime at the Stewart family place. So that's Outdoors with Jim. Check him out on his channel. I'll have the link in the description down below. All right, guys. Catch good talking to y'all. Hope to see you again out here for part three. Let us know what you let us know in the comment sections. So until then, we'll see you next time.